Okay, let's go to our sermon time. Let me ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And uh, let me start with verse 1. Jesus is speaking here and he says, Verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Jump down to verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I'll stop right there. Men are likened to sheep in the scriptures. God called his people a flock in the Old Testament. The Bible says, And ye my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 34, uh, verse 31. Good men have the qualities of sheep. They're harmless, they're uh, unoffensive, and they're meek, and they're under the hand of the shepherd or the shearer. The sheepfold was a place where the sheep were put for safety and protection, uh, either a secure corral or, if possible, a barn. And uh, there was one door going in or out, one way to enter or exit. For a believer, this is a great picture of his salvation, of his security in Christ and his home in heaven. In verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Excuse me. A lot of people have heard of Disneyland's Club 33. After you exit the Pirates of the Caribbean, to your left, there's just a plain door with the number 33 marked on it. If you aren't paying attention, you'll walk right by it. But if you have a corporate membership card, you can slide that card into the slot there, and the door opens to an elevator, which takes you up to a nicer restaurant where you can then socialize with other members. Um, there's probably a service entrance to it, and I wouldn't doubt that. But to my knowledge, this is the only door the patrons can enter in or exit from. To be a real Christian, to be a real believer in Jesus Christ, is to be a member of a very exclusive club. Not everyone can belong. Only those who come to God as sinners, admitting their guilt, trusting in Christ's sacrifice for them, can then be forgiven and thus say, I'm born again. Jesus said, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, verse 32. Are you a sinner? If you're a sinner, then Christ came for you. Later, he told his disciples, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Luke 15, verse 7. The Apostle Paul wrote that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he adds, of whom I am chief. Unless a sinner comes to God on God's terms, he can't call himself a Christian. He can't claim to be a true believer. He's not a member of the club. And the Lord Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You almost see an exclamation point should be there, by me. Is that clear? In our text, he said in verse 1, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Some ways men try to justify themselves or make peace with God, he rejects. 
And so I call this sermon, Some Other Ways. For, and there are only going to be two points, so don't worry about you know, getting a cramp in your hand from writing too much. Point number one, I would call this the way of the heathen. The way of the heathen. We read, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Jeremiah 10, verse 2. Then Jeremiah describes the actions of the heathen. In that text, they cut down a tree from the forest, they stand it upright, they decorate it with silver and gold ornaments, much as people do with Christmas trees. It's a very ancient practice. And they would attach religious significance or meaning to those ornaments. The one at the top might represent the sun, the, one below, the ones below might represent planets or things in the night sky. Webster's 1828 dictionary defined heathen like this, a pagan, a Gentile, one who worships idols or is unacquainted, unacquainted with the true God. World Book Encyclopedia says the first mention of the celebration of Christmas occurred in AD 336 in an early Roman calendar, which indicated December 25th as the uh, day of celebration. This, celebra this celebration was probably influenced by pagan festivals held at that time. The Bible says the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Psalm 135, verses 15 to 18. In other words, the person is just as spiritually dead as the idol he's just made. The way of the heathen is the way of blind, superstitious, religion, <clears throat> following some belief system that ultimately has no connection to the true God. The Roman Catholic Church calls itself Christianity, but it has very little in common with the Christians of the Bible, or the Christians in the New Testament, but it has a lot in common with the ways of the heathen. They are the ones that first introduced Christmas to the American colonies. They believe that their priests turn bread and wine into the human body and blood of Jesus. They're not simply symbols as we take them. Then they eat their God, drink his blood, and thus they have Christ in them. They even have a prayer during that ceremony which says, Blessed are you, Lord God Almighty. Through your goodness we have these gifts to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. They will become for us the body of Christ, and so forth. They make the wine, and they make the wafers, and then they grant to themselves the power to turn those things into the human flesh of Jesus, and thus they consume him. That's how a Catholic has Christ in him, by having eaten him at the altar. Any uneaten pieces are then put into a container, usually made of bronze or brass, called the tabernacle, closed with lock, under lock and key. So they know where their God is at any time. I've always thought it strange that all the wine gets finished, however. None of that's ever left behind. But this is part of the way of the heathen. The Apostle Paul said, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Acts 17 verse 29. He said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Acts 17, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4 Verse 24, their prayers are also empty and lifeless. Christ said, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. 
Matthew 6, verse 7. The way of the heathen is the way of someone who substitutes his own clever ideas for a true knowledge of God. And lest you think I'm singling out Roman Catholics today, I'm not. We're an equal opportunity offending church, right? <laughs> we'll pick on anybody if they conflict with the scriptures. Right. But the same forms, the same emptiness can be found in Islam, can be found in Hinduism, can be found in uh, Buddhism, if the truth be told, such as the making of a statue or image, then bowing down in front of it to honor the person that's depicted, the repetition of the same prayers on a string of beads or on a knotted rope, the lighting of candles and incense that symbolize your prayer because you really don't know how to pray. I led a girl to the Lord earlier this year who had been raised as a devout Roman Catholic. And I was trying to make it as simple as I could. And she said, I, I don't know how to pray. Can you help me? Which I was certainly happy to help her, but I wanted it to come from her own heart. But I thought, how sad. All of the years, I think she was about close to 30 years old. And uh, she didn't know how to pray. Some of these religious ideas date back long before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, such as Hinduism, which borrowed a lot of things from all over the world. It resembles uh, Greek mythology and Roman mythology, Egyptian mythology, such as worshiping the cow as the most revered animal, the sacred animal, just like the Israelites made the golden calf and danced around it back in Exodus 32. Hindus also worship monkeys, snakes, birds, and other animals. The Apostle Paul warned about this when he said, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. He says, and who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1, verses 23 to 25. And the Buddha, if he even existed, and I don't believe he did, around 550 BC, as the story goes, developed a system similar to Hinduism, but rather than believing in a myriad of gods, Buddhists claim they don't believe in any single governing god. Your own actions, the things you say, the things you do, the actions that you carry out, and the intentions behind them uh, will all determine what form you take in the next life, reincarnation. Even Judaism, the laws and the commandments of God gave to Moses in 1900 BC had become the way of the heathen by the time Christ showed up. Jesus condemned those who were trusting in the forms and ceremonies of the law uh, or in their upbringing as Israelites. He said, ye are they which justify yourselves before God, but God, or rather before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16, verse 15. If a man wanted to know God and have God reveal himself to him, the Paul writes, For the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3, 24. The Apostle Peter said in Acts 15, Why put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The law was very difficult and rigid and exacting in trying to keep it. It was just enough to show men that they couldn't keep it. They needed God to step in and do something for them that they could not do for themselves. Thus the Lord Jesus came to live among men, to walk among men, walk among men to then identify with men, but having no sins that needed to be forgiven like men do, he was able to die as their substitute. Thank the Lord he did. In our text, Jesus said in verse 8, All that ever came before me, not were, but are, thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. Their founders may be dead, but anyone who's still teaching their philosophies and their ideas 
is regarded as a thief and a robber. They're robbing men of the truth. Notice how Jesus condemns them in our text, verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. God could tell whether a Jew was seeking the truth of God or whether he was just doing his duty at the temple or the synagogue to please his relatives. Those who just did their religious duty, Paul says, uh, about them for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God Romans 10 verse 3 and you can include in all of that anyone who depends upon their denomination their church membership their water baptism their sacraments their ordinance their fasting their catechisms their uh, candles their religious giving their acts of charity or anything else God knows who the real hypocrites are. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. The way of the heathen is blind, empty, religious superstition, and it constitutes some other way. Point number two today is what I'd call the way of the fool. The Bible says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth to counsel is wise, Proverbs 12, verse 15. The contrast between a wise man and a fool is that the wise man will heed the warnings. He'll heed the counsel of someone who tells him don't do this or do this. The fool will not. The Bible also says fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Psalm 107, verse 17. A fool picks up a smoking habit at 20 years old. He, he's able to read the Surgeon General's warning that's on every pack. He knows people who have died of throat cancer and mouth cancer and lung cancer and emphysema. He's had it afflict people in his own family, people he's known or he's worked with. And he goes along through life thinking, yeah, it won't happen to me. It may or it may not, but you're a fool if you take that kind of risk. A fool doesn't take the long look down the road to see where his actions are going to lead unless he changes course. He's very short-sighted. Here are a few famous last words of fools. It's okay. I'm sure this will hold my weight. Let's put these two wires together and see what happens. Hey, everybody, watch this. <laughs> An old expression says, fools rush in where angels fear to tread or where a wise man never goes. There are religious fools and there are non-religious fools. The Bible says, Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee, Jude, verse 9. A religious fool rushes in to say, Satan, I rebuke you. I take authority over you. I bind you in Jesus' name. Well, how long are you going to bind him for? For a half hour? For a week? For the weekend? What do you mean by that? He's ignorant of the scriptures, and he has no idea who he's dealing with. Satan's been around a lot longer than you or I, and he's mastered all the tricks of deception. He knows if this doesn't cause you to stumble in your faith, he'll try something else. And then he, until he finds something that seems to work. And then only the grace of God and the, the Holy Spirit of God gets you back in fellowship with God once again. But there are also non-religious fools who think everything in life is working out as it should. It'll work out just fine. And they have no need for God. They have no need for salvation. The Bible says the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. The non-religious fools are like a few years ago. I think I told you about the federal park rangers at the Grand Canyon when we took our family there. They now give these little tour uh, speeches to the visiting tourists in about every half hour and say they now theorize that the canyon wasn't formed by the 
Colorado River, which it wasn't, but now it was formed by constant rainfall, bombarding it for 250 million years. And uh, they don't consider God, they don't consider, consider the Bible to be true in any way. If they just look around, they'd see that the striations go horizontally. The entire world was underwater at one time, and as the water receded, those uh, layers of deposit were put there. And you can find that uh, uh, phenomenon, or that, uh, that oh, what's the right word? <laughs> find that uh, fact in every mountain range throughout the world. Yet the fool says, I got another idea. I got a better idea. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, Romans 1, verse 22 tells us. So even though the ideas of a fool make him feel good about himself, if he's wrong, he's heading for judgment. The Bible also says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 14, verse 1. And so we regard atheism as a way of the fool. If he's wrong about God, he's heading for judgment. Billy Graham once said, and I'll give him credit for this, if the Bible was a lie and the gospel turned out to be false, I would still want to be a Christian because of the virtue it brings to men and its civilizing influence on the world. That was very well put. Consider the influence of Christ and the gospel on the world we live in. Baptists build hospitals. Methodists build hospitals. Presbyterians build hospitals. Lutherans build hospitals. Roman Catholics build hospitals. The Seventh-day Adventists build hospitals. Loma Linda is one of the world's best. And I'll grant you those groups may disagree with each other about a hundred different things. But the person of Jesus Christ inspires men to do great things for his honor. A missionary to China, William Carey, once famously said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. There are even hospitals named after Christ's titles. Good Shepherd Hospital, Shepherd of the Valley, Shepherd of the Hills, and so on. You can find one hospital not far from here named after one of his parables, Good Samaritan in Los Angeles. That's also one of the best hospitals in our country. But where are the atheist hospitals? Where are the skeptic hospitals or the skeptics uh, children's uh, cancer hospitals or cancer treatment centers? Where are the free thinkers uh, medical clinics? They don't exist and don't look for them either. Oxford and Cambridge universities centuries ago were started to train Christian workers, ministers of the gospel, and the work of Jesus Christ. Likewise, Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Dartmouth and our Ivy League schools were started in this country to train ministers and missionaries and Christian lay workers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The University of Chicago was influenced by Baptists. USC, University of Southern California, was started by Methodists about 130 years ago. They were known as the Fighting Wesleyans after John Wesley, until they changed their mascot to the Trojans in about the 1920s. Even the University of California at Berkeley was founded by the First Presbyterian Church of San Francisco. The pastor of that church served as the college's first president. Mighty how the mighty have fallen, but the point I want to make is uh, atheists wouldn't know what higher education was if the Christian church hadn't given it to them in some form. A famous, a famous atheist, Sir Julian Huxley, described faith in God as outdated furniture to be thrown over the side of the ship. And he said this in 1969, many people assert that the abandonment of the God hypothesis means the abandonment of all religious of all religion and all moral sanctions. This is simply not true. But it does mean 
Once our relief at jettisoning an outdated piece of ideological furniture is over, that we must construct something to take its place. Here we are in 2019, 50 years later, still waiting for atheists to offer something better than the gospel of Jesus Christ. They like to write books and pamphlets and engage in public debates, but they don't do anything. They don't offer the world anything. Several years ago, about 2007, there was an a, a article in the LA Times citing a George Barna research poll. George Barna is a professing Christian, and I think he's genuinely saved, uh, but he's a pollster and he takes surveys of a lot of different things. And among his surveys, he found these results. 19% of people between the ages of 18 and 22 call themselves atheists. 14% between the ages of 23 and 41 call themselves atheists. And only 9% between the ages of 42 and 60 still call themselves atheists. People to tend to consider the possibility of God more as they get older, and that's good. But the fool does not. The survey also found that people with no faith at all typically donated $200 annually to charities. That's far less than the average $1,500 given by believers to different charities. The Bible says, Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 3. The famous atheist Christopher Hitchens, he died in 2011, but he would often ask in his public debates, and you can find them on the internet now, he would ask, what good things do Christians do in the name of God that an atheist couldn't also do without citing any sort of religious motivation for? And he seemed to stump his opponents in debate. They didn't know how to respond to that. I know how to, I would respond. The, the natural response should have been, well, there's nothing that a Christian does claiming inspiration from God that an atheist could not also do. But there needed to be a follow-up question to that. So why aren't you doing them? That would have been the right follow-up question. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge said, quote, It is hard to see how a great man can be an atheist. Without the sustaining influence of faith in a divine power, we could have little faith in ourselves. We need to feel, excuse me, right in mid-quote, I have a, a note page to turn. He said, we need to feel that behind us is intelligence and love. Doubters do not achieve. Skeptics do not contribute. Cynics do not create. Faith is the great motive power, and no man realizes his full possibilities unless he has a deep conviction that life is eternally important and that his work, well done, is part of an unending plan. Well, the believer wants to hear God say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew 25, verse 21. But the atheistic fool sees all of this. He can't deny the influence of Christianity. He sees how lives are changed in those people who truly know Jesus Christ. And he still walks away saying, so what? Then the Bible also tells us, fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Proverbs 14, verse 9. Who are these religious people who want to force their Bible down our throats and tell our kids how to live and force their morality on us? Nobody has the right to tell me what to think or what to say or how to live or what's, what I'm doing is wrong. And we read in the Bible, the transgression of the wicked saith within his heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. 
Psalm 36, verse 1. The fool has no regard for the law of God. He lives to satisfy himself now and never considers the future. He's trying to climb up some other way. He's a thief and a robber. His mind is made up. Nobody can persuade him uh, otherwise. If there is a God, he's willing to take his chances standing before God someday. Someone has said the best preparation for tomorrow is to do what you ought to do today. You need to get saved today. Doing it your way turns out to be the wrong way. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16, verse 25. Notice how that changes from a singular, a way, to a plural, the ways of death. Every sinner thinks he's okay with God. His life is acceptable. His philosophy is fair. And um, if the truth, the truth is, all of those things constitute some other ways, the ways of death. Christ said in our text today, verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Peter said, For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. Paul wrote, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. And then John writes, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. The way of the heathen... Church, religion, is not enough. It constitutes some other way. And the way or the ways of a fool, short-sighted, ignorant of other people's warnings, also constitutes the way of a fool or the way of a heathen. Those ways may make you feel good, but they also make you the enemy of God. 